The French Emperor has nothing in the world to fear from us. We are for peace from one end of this land to the other. No English Cherbourg threatens invasion to the happy shores of France. But we on our side have grave reasons for alarm. Far be it from us to say that it is his purpose to attack us unprovoked. Who can decipher the future of the world? Who can read the intentions of a mind so dark and deceitful? But one thing assuredly we do know, should it be in his interest or his aim to initiate a war against us, no feeling of friendship or plighted faith will stand one moment in his way. Henceforth, any ministry which would command English sympathy must stand aloof from Louis Napoleon, courteously but firmly aloof, and may heaven forever protect us from any more such faithful allies. Good evening. I'm Brett Gibbons. I'm joined tonight with Major the Lord Rivers. And as you can already tell, the topic of our discussion this evening is the French War Scare of 1859. And I'll have you know that... You know this, right? The French are out to get us. It's true. You read it in the paper, did you? Yes. Yes. <laughs> it so, must be true. The French are coming. Yes. So Build more iron-cased ships. The French are slash were coming um, in the year 1859. Um, in the, the military build-up from Napoleon. Oh, we're we going with smoking cats. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Mm. Must look ridiculous for the videos. Yes, I'm now suitably comfortable. So, the French. They are the French. poised to strike at England. They want revenge for Waterloo. Louis Napoleon, now Napoleon III, emperor of all the French, wishes to... Uh, build upon his empire. He's mucking about in Italy, taking territory away from the Habsburgs and giving it to Republican upstarts in, uh, in Italia. And um, the launch of the Gloire, this is too much. It's too much, I say, Captain. That's a very interesting period that is often overlooked because it sits in between uh, the Followed of the Crimean War and the start of the American Civil War in uh, the early 1860s. But very few people realize that France, or at least the British, believed that France was uh, like about to invade them, the, the British. Um, if uh, whether it was true or not, they, there was definitely that perception. Yes, but some of us Whigs knew they were up to something. And there's very little on this topic to be found anywhere. If if you want to learn about the French war scare, the invasion scare of '59, uh, you you have to dig and look for people's doctoral dissertations to find anything on it. And I think it's it's a little fascinating period that uh, that bears out a discussion because there's it's the intersection of so many things the the military revolution that uh, first began in the Crimean War and and followed um, the breakup of the the Metternich's balance of power and the waltz of nations uh, following the end of the. Uh, Napoleonic Wars. You have the birth of Italy, which itself would uh, would soon follow with the birth of a unified Germany, and um, and then you have the British 
uh, feeling particularly inferior after watching the French performance in the Crimean War and then the, the naval race and, uh, and the explosion of the, the British rifle volunteer movement in response to the invasion scare, which would then translate, eventually uh, become the territorials that would be the reserve component for the British Army in World War I. So there's so many different intersecting points that surround the, the French invasion scare of 1859, and it, was, it started really in 1858, and it... Uh, didn't die out completely until the early I think 1960s, it, it when the American is, War scare begins, and we'll, <laughs> I'm sure we'll talk about that. Eventually. I think that's why it always stood out to me. There's always so many different things going on, and that's why I still think the uh, the French are coming. They might be up to something, you know. Well, they're building all those iron cased ships. They are. They are. They're still building iron ships after all those years. <laughs> after all those years. So. This all developed, of course, um, I believe, with the, uh, the first real start of the, the Franco-English um, Franco arms race is the release uh, of the Napoleon um, in 1850, which is, of course, the first purpose-built uh, steam battleship. It looks like uh, HMS Victory, but with, a, with some steam funnels. Um, which, of course, prompts this uh, necessity of further naval spending, which, uh, is, of course, gets opposed in Parliament the whole way. And then, of course, we have uh, Crimea is, is a, a stunning example of two people uh, on the same side, but very much competing. And we've talked about that at nauseum. Um, but is there, is there a, a, a starting point that, that you see the build-up throughout the 1850s that sort of gets us towards the 1859 uh, scale? Yeah, there's, there's a few things. You have to, I have to consider before the British got involved, the reason the British got involved, you could say, uh, to, to uh, ostensibly support the Ottoman Empire in the Crimean War was um, this this argument began after the Russian Navy just destroyed the Ottoman Turkish fleet at uh, Sinope um, before the um, British and French involvement. And, and that's uh, really the advent of the, the use of the shell gun exactly. rather than any, new, any sort of... New naval both technology. Most, bo most of both navies are steam powered. Uh, they're, yeah, they were getting there. Yeah. Um, but the, the Russians had, uh, as you mentioned, this new type of gun, the shell gun. So it's a, a large cannon that instead of firing just a cannonball, like, like warships have done for the last 200 years or you know, longer, the gun is designed in such a way that it's strong enough to uh, fire a very large shell filled with gunpowder so that when the shell hits a wooden ship, it not only penetrates through the wooden side of the ship, but then it explodes. So the uh, comparative damage, shell for, sh you know, shot for shot being inflicted is uh, orders of magnitude greater than what just a solid cannonball could do. So the Russian Navy, um, and, and they had declared, the you know, their war with the Ottoman Empire was a legitimate act of war. Their Navy went down to the Turkish uh, naval base at Sinope and with these modern guns, just smash the Turkish fleet into matchsticks. And at that point, all the previous ships in the world, all the old ships of the line that did not have these shell guns, well, they were now obsolete. And uh, you saw a, a emerging naval race on uh, you know everyone's obtaining these shell guns, the uh, Pike's Hands guns, after the uh, the inventor of, of the gun. And um, there was this Russian naval victory, which is not particularly a common thing, uh, sent uh, shockwaves uh, through, through Britain and France as well, because their concern is, uh, you know, they realized, oh, wow, here's the Russians. They've just destroyed a fairly strong navy at, uh, at Sinope. But it is the so Turks. They're the undisputed masters of the Black Sea. John Paul Jones did it. And if Russia is not stopped, they may continue their attack in advance, and they may take Constantinople, and then, horror of horrors, 
the Russians will be in the Mediterranean and their Russian traders will be competing with French and British traders. Russian warships will be protecting Russian interests on the Mediterranean. And this was enough for France to crawl into bed and make common cause with Britain um, in the Crimean War. And they, they still very much suspected each other. Uh, uh, Lord Raglan went to the Crimea, uh, often referring to France as the enemy yes. <laughs> instead of Russia. You know, France, the old uh, Napoleonic enemy. And the seeds of this are also in uh, Napoleon III's desire to restore France as a world power. Of course, after Waterloo, 1815, uh, the monarchy was restored and, and France went back to being, um, you know, in, in, in Metternich's balance of power. Not a very significant force, uh, as, you know, especially in the world. And Louis Napoleon wanted to, uh, in some way, restore France to well, the whole to the whole ascension, the, the whole ascension of Louis Napoleon to becoming Emperor of the French is is incredibly alarming to Britons and and to the rest of Europe. It really shouldn't have been because wasn't he rather fond of Britain? And oh yeah, yes, yes. I mean, that's that's one of my favorite quotes from the War Scare. Is actually from my good friend Lord Palmerston. He says. At the bottom of his heart, there rankles a deep and inextinguishable desire to punish England, which is incredibly <laughs> ironic because because Louis Napoleon, Napoleon III, really does he is an Anglophile. He he um, expresses great uh, sympathies with the English and, and admires a great deal of uh, English culture, English technology. And uh, where does he go when he's exiled by the Prussians? England lives out the rest of his days there. So. Um, the, the wrong, perhaps it is the idea, though, that he's returning as an imperial monarch, um, uh, able to upset the balance of power, able to, you know, on a whim, um, decide that um, the kingdom of Piedmont Sardinia is going to um, take northern Italy away from, from Habsburg, Austria, um, you know, decide... Uh, the, the the sovereignty of the papal states it's 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 upsetting um, to to a, to a lot of Britons to think that a, uh, such a Frenchman is making all of those uh, calls on his own rather than this perceived um, concert of Europe. So that's 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 my take on Louis Napoleon, Louis Napoleon. upstart despot, but he does like the English. Well, he he went to war with him. Uh, in the Crimea, and uh, alongside, and since alongside, yes, and the French contingent that fought in the the French did the heavy lifting during the the Crimean War. Significantly more casualties. Yeah, they, they significantly the, the more of troops as well. It's 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 similar to uh, you know how the Soviet Union did the heavy lifting in uh, in the Second World War. In what? And, yes. Oh. Now, when the Crimea, the French did the heavy lifting, um, and they projected twice the number of troops than the British did to the Crimean Peninsula. And the British realized, uh, because they were watching very closely, and, and all things French have been, in, for, in, in military fashion, have been, have been copied. I mean, American soldiers went through the whole Civil War, uh, in many cases, wearing one of the most useless pieces of military headgear, almost as useless as the smoking cap. <laughs> the I am be. kept quite warm indoors, <laughs> and I don't know about you if you're sitting on some sunny beach, but um, Britain is a dark and damp place, and this, uh, this actually is quite a practical hat. Now, I don't want to comment on your French military fashion. Maybe the cap is useless, but... Um, you know, the French cappy there, but uh, the smoking cap, that I will defend. Mm. Well, that well. aside, the French were being watched, and the French were watching the, right the so. British as well. And the lesson of the Crimean War, which was mildly alarming, it was more humiliating than it was alarming for the British, because um, come what may, no matter how good the French are, you know, we have the Royal Navy. 
iron men and wooden ships. Quite you know, right. Hearts of oak are our men, hearts of oak are our ships. The British uh, are safe from invasion because of the, the wooden walls of the Royal Navy will simply keep the French from crossing the English Channel. So it was more of a, in the eight, 18, uh, about 1855, 1856, it was a humiliation for the British to see how much better the French were at war than they were. Um, the British arrived in the Crimea with a, not only did they have a smaller force, uh, and the, the French had twice the number of troops, but the French were well supplied throughout. Uh, their soldiers were adequately fed, uh, they had warm clothing, they, they even had materials sent to them to build winter um, shelters and huts and things in the siege lines around Sevastopol, while the British just almost literally freezed in the ground in their trenches. And, and their coffee they, was issued they, roasted. Right, that the French had a, uh, a, a far superior uh, commissariat system that, uh, that cooked the food for the soldiers. The soldier had his little mess tin and he went in line and they plopped the food in his mess tin and that's what he ate. Where the British were issuing the soldiers green coffee beans and three pounds of meat and no wood to cook it on. So here you go, here's your ration. And uh, the French had horses, they had uh, warm clothing, and they had mules. And the, the greatest in, indignity for the British was to go over to the French, their allies, and beg to borrow some mules to haul the carts of their sick and wounded the eight miles down to Sevastopol because all of the there were there was no fodder for the British mules and the British horses that were just dying in droves. And so the British realized the French are very good at war. Uh, the, the period sources always throw in the little asterisk that the British soldier is still the better fighter. When bullets are flying, the British soldier is still better, and British pluck and determination wins out. I see this in almost every period source I've read. But then they immediately go right back to saying the French are, um, they're better at war. And, uh, and one of my favorite sources said the, the French brought an army to the Crimea, whereas the British didn't. And that's, that's a beautiful, summary of the experience of the of the ground campaign in the Crimean War. And so at the strategic level they are they are certainly better at doing war. Yes, and the takeaway for the British from this is that the French have the capability, I mean they're back. You know, after being de defeated under Napoleon and Waterloo and crushed, they are now a preeminent military power and, and to think of the logistical requirements it takes to take a hundred thousand men, move them, you know, some thousands of miles in the mid 1850s, invade an enemy country, and then bring everything you need to supply yourself on on a sustained basis for months and months and years is uh, is quite remarkable. And and the British failed at that due to the the obsolescent nature of their system. The uh, they disparagingly called it the circumlocution system. The so circumlocution it's, it's something system. something of a Kafkaesque nightmare um, of how do we build a road from Balaclava, which is where all the British supply ships were coming into, up to the siege lines at Sevastopol. It's simply eight miles, and it is not too hard to build an eight-mile road. But this Kafkaesque system of complexity and you have to go here and you have to go here and squabbles over whose job it is to build the road meant that it simply did not get done. Meanwhile, the French did build roads. They did bring their supplies up um, to their encampment, a much more efficient system. And being able to bring all this supply and, and sustainment that they needed for uh, a major ground campaign thousands of miles from France. So the British takeaway from the ground campaign of the Crimean War is that the French are very, very good at ground war, uh, better than we are. And they said the French brought an army, we didn't bring an army to the Crimean War. But we don't have to worry about that because we have the Royal Navy. But all that changes with Le Gloire. 
Yeah, well, the Lagua itself was the was taking to the next logical step uh, an innovation that was actually uh, first seen in the Crimean War. The floating batteries. Yes. So, for those of you that don't know, there, there's a great deal more to the Crimea outside of Crimea. And we have discussed the different campaigns, but the naval war is actually incredibly interesting. Um, there's an entire tiny naval campaign in the Sea of Azov. There's a lot going around, zipping around the Black Sea. But there's an entire campaign in the Baltic. And um, the Baltic is where we see another miniature naval arms race, particularly um, using larger guns and mortars to shell um, Russian emplacements. And one of the innovations we see, uh, particularly from the French, is um, armored floating batteries. And we also see um, uh, mortar floats, which are of varying construction. Some, some are iron, um, but we see this floating battery, which they produce a great many of, and it's an armored ship, um, which can bring a large caliber gun to bear on a, uh, an enemy port. And, and this is, this is what's absolutely frightening to the British, that uh, uh, you can bring a, an impervious vessel um, up to um, a, a, a port, up to the shore, and uh, mm -hmm. begin to shell. And so Le Gloire is the next step in that, with, with an, iron, um, an iron clad, it's, a, it's still a wooden hull construction, but it is a full iron-clad battleship, right. and um, that that comes out, and, and it that is really the start of the French war scare, is it not? Yeah, I, I remember ships have these new shell guns, like yeah. these Pike's hands guns, and so logically, it makes absolute sense to start throwing these things in your fortresses as well, so that now your your coastal defenses can fire the same destructive shells into, you know, the wooden ships of everyone's navy. And the Russians did exactly that in, uh, in Sevastopol and at, um, is it Kin, Kinburn on the Dnieper? Yes. Where the, where the French attacked with their, their um, floating batteries and the, so the Pike's Hands guns, and so it's, it's check and checkmate, check and checkmate with naval technology advancing very quickly as it would through the, the remainder of the 19th century and, and into the first 50 years of the 20th, uh, at least surface warfare. But, uh, you know, now fortresses have these guns, and so if, if you want to reduce the enemy's fortresses, it is a suicide mission to sail or even steam a wooden warship up and to shoot at this fortress. And, you know, you have to take the fortress out before you can land and occupy the, the city or the port or the arsenal or whatever you're trying to do. So the response to that of the Russians putting these Pike's Hands shell guns into their fortresses was, well, the French thought, we will just slap a layer of iron on our on these floating batteries, and uh, they did have steam engines on them. Indeed, they, uh, but but not really. Just and correct me if I'm wrong, but they were just enough to like point them in the right direction and like barely. And then some, of course, out. were just towed. But they couldn't be penetrated by these shell guns. They would, uh, and and as I remember, and this isn't my strong my strength uh, by any means but uh, I want to say the French uh, batteries were hit quite a bit by the Russian guns uh, when they attacked uh, at the mouth of the Dnieper but they they just bounced off um, and uh, and as you said La Gua is uh, is that right? La Gua? Gloire. La Gua French is the the next logical step, right? So you've got this floating battery, it's already got a steam engine on it, it's already got heavy guns. 
The next step is just to make one that's a little bit bigger and is ocean going so it can steam around under its own power. And um, the strategic ramification of that is that just like the Pike's hand gun made every wooden ship in the world obsolete, now La Gloire made every we, ship. As they say. La Gloire made every ship in the world instantly overnight obsolete. And they laid the, uh, La Gloire down in May of 1858. And this, uh, the British had uh, been reasonably certain that uh, you know, even if relations go in the tanks with the French, well, the Royal Navy will protect us from invasion. Now, the French have a warship that is unsinkable. Our shells cannot hurt it. It is single-handedly superior to any ship in our entire Navy. And uh, just to ratchet up the alarm, and the French lay down three of them, La Gloire and uh, two sister ships. May heaven protect us forever from any such faithful allies. So. And this is at exactly the same time as, uh, as La Gloire is being laid down that France starts, um, is it fair to say, uh, kind of shaking the table upon which the they delicate balance the of power in British eyes. Now, you'll have to remember, um, one of the pieces to the puzzle um, is the fact that uh, Piemonte Sardinia, um, under uh, Vittorio Emanuele, the king, and then, of course, Conte Cavour is the, um, um, the, the miracle worker there, uh, participates uh, to a small degree, the uh, in the Crimean War, there are Sardinian troops that fight alongside everyone, and they are heavily engaged at uh, at a number of uh, battles. Not many casualties, but they do, they do take uh, they do take some casualties, and many did die from disease. Um, but uh, that was a token effort to to um, win over the French and get French support for a move against. Austria and um, wrest the territory of uh, northern Italy um, away from the um, Habsburgs. The, the, the Habsburgs and and finally move Piemonte Sardinia um, to become the kingdom of Italy and and it's that it's that campaign in 58 that we uh, we see the French actively supporting uh, Sardinia on the road unilaterally without without, without the any sense yeah. of the British and this adds to their alarm and there are there are historians that don't don't truly believe there was a uh, an accepted concert of Europe but we can we can point to a a great many um, crises where there is the necessity of international consensus, and and the Crimea is a brilliant example of that. That uh, you know, the Russians are moving down in the Balkans, and here comes Austria mobilizing and saying, "No, no, no." Yes, but the the Crimea is also the a, a preservation of the status quo, a very yeah. to France and Britain a very beneficial status quo, and obviously to the Turks a very beneficial status quo, but to Russia the status quo was left them at a decided disadvantage. And so the Western powers, you know, in to uphold Metternich's careful balance uh, to their advantage, you know, intervene. And now France, and this is the British perception. Here are the French, they're very good at war. Okay, yawn, we got the Royal Navy. Oh no, they have Le Croix, Le Gloire. And now they're off doing things on their own because in the British perception, Louis Napoleon sees himself as the new, he's gonna make France the new leading power of Europe. And uh, by definition, this means he needs to humble England so that France can be preeminent. Quite. So these are the alarm bells as- uh, There as are many alarm bells. La Gloire is being laid down and it's, you know, 36 
6.4 inch rifle guns on it would just make splinters of, of any British ship afloat. And he's doing his own thing in, uh, in Italy and he's you know, going to make himself uh, the, the preeminent power in Europe and, and that's, <laughs> as you mentioned, the, the satirical, you know, with friends like these, yes. you know, or with allies like these, who needs enemies? And it, it starts a multi-year and very expensive Surprises. invasion scare that, that led to a, a large swath of the British public becoming completely convinced that France could invade tomorrow. And um, the, the, I think you were reading from the Saturday Review there were articles in the Saturday Review yes. um, that uh, the Royal Navy, even on paper, is larger, but we're, it's scattered in all of our, our uh, colonial outposts. And so it would take weeks and weeks and months to recall them back. And even then, we might not be able to stop the French because of their, their new um, ironclads or, or yes. iron-cased yeah. ships, as, as they were called. And, uh, and they knew that in, it took France one week to move their army from France to land in, um, in uh, the Ottoman Empire on their way to the Crimea. And so if it only takes them a week to cross the entire Mediterranean, in one, one or two days they could select their landing site in England wherever they wanted and land basically unopposed. And uh, so with, with these... Uh, kind of alarm bells ringing. Uh, what is that? Palmerston, who says we need all these new forts. Yes, so there's, <laughs> I would say there's four responses. There's the forts, there's some very well spent money with the construction of HMS Warrior, which we'll get to. Um, there's the volunteer movement, and then there's the diplomatic option, which is. It never works. works. No, no, never <laughs> works. Never works. So let's talk about the the um, the money not well spent first, because we we have eleven. Uh, what is it? Eleven million pounds about at the time spent on um, the defence of ports and the construction of new forts all around the coastline. I'm not too familiar on. On the forts themselves or the expenditure except um, what I have read uh, many officers of the British Army you know they were Palmerston's follies from the start uh, uh, the and, and many folly of, the, of course interesting play on words there because that's that's not only the the folly as in the mistake but also the folly as in the uh, the landscape design where you you have a, a Useless, useless little building built off in the distance, and uh, you know a, a a fake ruin or a a castle turret in your garden. The the it's a very nice thing that we spent a great deal of money on. That's now just <laughs> sitting with brand new uh, brand new artillery in it. One of our favorite people, uh, Colonel Wilford, who was the chief instructor at the School of Musketry at Hythe. And the school of musketry was on the beach, and you, you would fire your rifles out to sea. There was no backstop. You just shot at targets out to sea. So on the beach, they could look down the beach a ways, and there was an old Martello tower. And uh, the opinion of many of the officers, Colonel Wilford, uh, preeminent among them, was that the defense of England from invasion is in the riflemen and not these fixed useless towers that uh, you know Le Gloire could steam up to just like the iron clad batteries at um, at Kinburn and just smash it to rubble while our shot bounces off the uh, iron hull um, which ties into the the volunteer movement which also explodes in 1859 and it had been around since 1852 um, but uh, it was, was uh, not supported by the government with any real encouragement or any sense of urgency 
until the the war scare of 1859 when it explodes. And, and some of my favorite books on rifle shooting, um, 1859, 1860, 1861, are flying off the shelves and, and you know, reprinting after reprinting. Uh, Hans Blusk was a, a prominent founder of the volunteer movement. And he's writing all these uh, fairly small, very you know easily readable books on rifle shooting and the volunteer movement. And some of them went to nine or more printings, just as fast as he could print them, they're selling. Because of this, you know, France could invade at any And we'll, time. we'll cover it more extensively at a later point, but the rifle volunteer movement essentially is a, a volunteer club, I might call it, with um, mm -hmm. where men would join and and train as a volunteer military force, and they would have their own um, marksmanship and drill, and uh, of mm -hmm. course ammunition was supplied. Were the were the muskets rifle muskets supplied? No, but you could get one. You could get just a government issue rifle at fairly low cost. But uh, most of the rifle volunteers, to paint with a broad brush. Or, or gentlemen of some means, so oh. the upper Genteel middle persons. upper middle class, and they uh, they purchased from the best gun makers of the time very high quality rifles, and the the rifle volunteers are were yeah a combination of rifle military themed shooting club with with uh, military reserve. Uh, duties and, and there's uh, was a debate at the time over uh, between the professional officers of the army uh, what do we if we get invaded tomorrow what do we do with 150,000 you know upper middle class gentlemen who show up with their rifles um, are they actually going to be an effective deterrent or an, are they going to be of use against these professional French forces that... And it is uh, a heated debate whether they would is. actually have been effective. Or are they going to... Are, are they going to be, you know, to, to reach into another century, are they going to be the Volkssturm clogging the streets of Berlin at the end of the, <laughs> the Second World War? There's a second prevent... I mean, there's quite a few of them. Oh. Preventing the actual German army from doing their job. Um, and uh, in, in general, the paint with a very broad brush, the volunteers, uh, as a movement, uh, seem to have been tolerated because it, it would be a pity to discourage them. Because you've got these patriotic gentlemen that have a stake in the country. You know, we own property, we, we, we have money, and we have a, a, a very real uh, inherent personal reason to see Britain survive and defeat her enemies right. and so if there's 200,000 of, of these men who want to spend their own money on uniforms and rifles and, and practice rifle shooting and, and come out in defense of the country in her hour of need um, is this something the government should discourage and by and large the consensus was no it's it's a it's it's a worthwhile thing that we should we should encourage you know such patriotic devotion, but uh, again the question of whether it actually would be of any real service. Now there's a, the royal commission. There was a royal commission on the defense of the United Kingdom in 1859, and they say um, taking into account the rifle volunteers and and what was currently available for the the defense of uh, the British Isles, not acceptable, not acceptable. So, Which just added uh, to the alarm. It, will, it adds to the alarm, but it also allows um, um, those in Parliament to, to advocate for further military spending and further spending on um, the, the more Martello Towers. And Warrior, which is, which is 700,000 pounds well spent. The, um, but the, just back to circle around to the... the Shore defenses. It wasn't uh, wasn't entirely uh, illogical because it wasn't defenses all along the coast. They did decide you know, we must just defend the ports. We must just um, you know defend our uh, our supply points, our um, 
uh, important coastal um, points. And that was, uh, you know, certain strategic ports were chosen and 100,000 pounds spent here, million pounds spent here, and, uh, but again, they are fixed defenses in a, uh, in a time that's increasingly um, able to, to obliterate those fixed right. defenses. And, and I know Palmerston, and this is uh, probably the stereotypical... No, don't say anything bad about Palmerston. No, the stereotypical, if, uh, among anyone who knows anything about Palmerston sports, the, the most popular thing about them was the ones around Portsmouth that were actually, their guns pointed inland, <laughs> into England and not out to sea to defend against an invasion from the sea. And there was a perfectly logical reason for this, and that's so that you could defend Portsmouth in the event that the French invade, and they're going to be attacking Portsmouth from the land. So the fortifications naturally were aimed out at the land, but it, to, uh, to the, the British press of the time, this just gave them endless fodder Correct. to point out, look at this folly, <laughs> with, yeah. I'm sure the double meaning of the word um, very much in mind, you know, look, we just spent how many hundreds of thousands of pounds on a fork that's facing the wrong way, just... Uh, Lord Cupid did nothing wrong. <laughs> Old Pam. So, and the, 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 let's talk a little bit about HMS Warrior, the first iron-hulled battleship in the in the Royal Navy. In Probably the, the only iron-hulled battleship left today. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and you can still see it. You can still go to it. But it's still um, commissioned, isn't it? That I'm not sure. I think, it, I think so. I think it and Victory are still commissioned. Hmm. My memory so, gets better the deeper I get into the Scotch. Yes. Well. HMS Warrior, the response to the Gloire, and um, certainly probably capable of uh, taking on the Monitor and the Merrimack together, but we'll get to that at a different date. Um, tell us a little bit about HMS Warrior. It was a better ship than uh, the than Gloire. Uh, it, was, it was longer, the uh, only thing I would fault it on is, uh, you know, it. It's uh, 1860, it was launched, and by 1866, the uh, Austrians had demonstrated a new naval weapon that would uh, obsess everyone for the next uh, almost 75 years, and that was the ram. And Le Glois had a rambow. If you look at a picture of the warrior and, yeah. and look at a picture of Le Glois, the Le Glois bow jutted out towards the waterline, and whereas the warrior had the traditional clipper bow, which made her faster. Yes, she can go faster yes. and she can carry more coats. So, carry so more guns. if they choose to ram, she can just walk away. Right, but uh, you know, keep in mind that the CSS Virginia was her primary weapon, was her, she was a casemate ram. Because no one in 1860 had any guns that could penetrate each other's armor. So theoretically, if the Gloire and the Warrior went out to battle, they would just fire at each other and all of their ordnance would simply bounce off. As, uh, as they, at the time, that some black powder did not have the penetrating power to send a, a ball or a shot through armor. And so eventually in the American Civil War, the, uh, the US Navy did lots of tests on, on chilled head steel, uh, bimetal bolts and things to see what can we use to punch through But they don't armor. work if you only use half a charge. Right, as the, the monitor <laughs> found out. Uh, well, the Virginia's armor was very thin compared to Boyer. And Le Gloire had, had five inches of iron plate, and the, the Confederates would have, would have tickled themselves pink if they could slap five inches of precious armor plate onto, uh, onto their ships. Uh, 
but uh, and and eventually, even in the black powder era, they would come up with with special types of shells uh, or bolts because uh, a shell, that a, anything that's hollow, is too weak to penetrate iron. So they were uh, they had to revert back to bolts to try to punch through the armor. But Warrior was a better ship. It was uh, it was larger. It was faster. It was a, a a, a better seagoing ship than uh, Le Gloire. Uh, and Le Gloire was simply the Napoleon, their ship of the line, that uh, steam powered ship of the line. But they took the design of the Napoleon and, and kind of slapped iron on it. Whereas what made Warrior revolutionary was it was in t there's it's not a wooden hull, it's an iron mm -hmm. hull. So it, uh, you know, that alone. Uh, was uh, the predecessor of the modern battleship because it, it was iron. But uh, what would have happened if, if Warrior and, and her sister ship Black Prince actually went into battle with the three Le Gloire class ships? Who's to say? But I guess the good news is Napoleon III wasn't actually planning to invade England no, after all. No. <laughs> and, and, and that's one of the interesting things about this period is you have, you have some more level-headed individuals like uh, Cobden, um, you know, the Manchester liberals that are um, saying, let's take all of this, all of this uh, fervor and all of this uh, money that we have set aside for military spending and let's go talk to the French and let's go be their friends. And uh, that's actually when we get this uh, treaty. 1860? In 1860, there's this free trade treaty uh, between Those uh, never work. France, France and, England, and Britain. And uh, they, you know, the war scare is pretty much brought to an end. There's uh, a new scare that follows. Right there's after. a new scare. There's always a scare. But um, for, to, for the most part, we see, we see everything quieting down. And um, you know the, the Whigs, the Whigs go their own way, and um, it's things sort of settle. France and Britain, briefly. There's um, through the the seventies and eighties. There's still a a uh, naval arms race. Oh, we're and, still watching them even now. They, oh yes, yes. Well. <laughs> Everything started to go into the tanks for Britain the moment they cozied up to the frog eaters. Quite. <laughs> Quite. I, I, I won't, make, won't make any further comments there. But, um, so that's the French War Scare. Any, uh, any other interesting vignettes from the French War Scare that you'd like to cover? Mm. I like talking about warrior. I don't like much talking about, you know, free trade treaties and peace and all that. No, it, it would have been interesting because, you know, I'm, I'm obsessed with 19th century musketry. Really? And the, yeah, the, the first indications of what would evolve into the modern soldier and, uh, and the ordinance for it, which, you know, I have no idea why that fascinates yeah. me. Um, but uh, it would have been interesting to, because the, the French and the British in 1859 had two very different views of the individual soldier and, uh, and the use of the rifle. And the use of the bayonet. Or the, the French were, were and, and the French maintained this through the First World War. And, and they went into the First World War with, you know, le pantalon rouge. And the kepis. And, and the kepis with, uh, you know, allons à la bayonet. In, into shattering German machine guns with the, you can see the these these earlier concepts uh, in World War One. The the French theory was just the sheer moral force of of this advancing French army. The Germans would look up and see them, and just the the moral force of charging Frenchmen across this field. In, in massive numbers would overwhelm German machine guns. And, uh, and we see a little bit of that in, uh, in the French 
tactics of the 1850s that's got Solferino. It's, it's very much encouraging the bayonet, the, the um, very athletic forms of warfare. I mean, pole vaulting essentially over walls and, uh, and other things that they were. They inspired were the Americans. On. It, it did. McClellan noted it, and uh, <laughs> and they go, they go wearing, anymore. completely adopting the kepi, and yeah. some of them even wear the, the zouave uniform. It, it would have been interesting, and of course, I'm glad it didn't happen because it, it would have been catastrophic. But it would have been interesting, simply from the military historian's yeah. point of view, which which mid 19th century rifle musket era army of trained professionals, which school of thought on the battlefield, where it all counts, which one was better? Because we don't see that in the American Civil War. You've got two mobs of amateur militia armies who, you know, two months ago, you didn't know the difference between, you know, uh, a, a musket and uh, a pipe wrench. And now you're a soldier, at, you know, at, at first bull run. And so you just, march up so close that you can't miss and you just blaze away. Um, it's it, The American Civil War is not a good context for 19th century land warfare. Uh, but, the, but France and Britain on the battlefield, 1859, where you have the British who would fight in, in the line or in open skirmish order. And you could even throw the rifle volunteers in. You're fine. Here's, here's, a hundred thousand rifle volunteers to hide behind your, the walls of your enclosures and, and pick off the Russian cavalry at 600 yards versus the French that move very quickly in column and they, and they advance with, um, with speed and the bayonet and their rifles don't even have adjustable sights, they just have a fixed back sight so that you, you can put your thumb up. don't have to waste time fiddling with sights like the, <laughs> they said the British do. Uh, it, it would have been very interesting from uh, from the historian, military historian's perspective, too. Uh, because all we can do is, is speculate. All we can do is speculate. I would throw my lot in on the side of British. Usually. Usually. It is an interesting time. It's, it's uh, 1859, 1858, all the way through 60, covers a very interesting time in uh, European history with the, you know, the advent of, uh, of Italy. Uh, the unification of Italy, you know, you have figures like Garibaldi, um, and then Napoleon the um, Third, such enigmatic figures, and we see uh, technology right at the forefront of Victorian technology, very with, uh, rapidly changing, yes, almost yeah. overnight. So that's the French War Scare. That's uh, though we're friends now, we're friends now, but we're always we're watching. We're always watching. We're always watching, and uh, you keep watching. Their return. Shall we away?